Hi, everyone. My name is Justin. I am with CG Spectrum. I am the head of employee relations. And today we're going to be doing a talk on how to build and sustain a thriving career in video games. We got some great guests with us, um, which we'll be introducing shortly. So today we're going to really cover the just expert career advice for game development artists entering the video game industry. Um, something that we've been seeing has been in kind of like a hot topic with a lot of uh, new devs and people in schools. All right, so uh, we're gonna kind of kick it off now. So uh, we're gonna go over for our schedule. We'll be meeting our panel, uh, which is Scott Bayless, Kelly Bershing, and Dan Leduca. Uh, we're gonna go over CG Spectrum, who we are, and then we're gonna jump into the panel discussion, which is gonna be basically where to start, studios and jobs, how to succeed, networking, after landing a job, and resources. Uh, then we'll do a CG Spectrum's game development course review, and then we'll have live Q&A. Let's get cracking. I am your host. Um, it's a better headshot of me than I really am. I'm the head of employer relations right now of partnerships for CG Spectrum and also a mentor. I've been in the gaming industry for 20 years, uh, which makes me pretty old in it. Uh, I've been I've worked on Tony Hawk, Kingdom Hearts, Mortal Kombat series. I've worked at Epic Games, Disney Interactive, Activision, Midway Games, just a, a load of them. And I've always been functioning uh, as an environment artist, artist lead, um, anything from production side. And so that's me. Next person would be. That would be me. So I'm Scott Bayless. Uh, I've been in the game biz for longer than I care to admit and uh, never, never lost my taste for it. Uh, work hard, work long, but enjoy what I do and have never stopped doing it. Um, I've been a dev, I've been an art director, I've been a producer game designer uh, and uh, executive at Microsoft, Capcom, and Midway. And in fact, Justin and I actually worked in the same studio for a while, way back so in the did, day. So did Dan. Yeah, that's brother. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah. we've got, we've got you know, stories we can share in this webinar then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We do. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually really excited to be here. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been doing this a long time and I've always felt that it's really important to keep cultivating uh, new uh, fresh talent into the into the industry, and I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say, and I'm excited to, to answer your questions. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Barshig. Um, I'm currently at a new and upcoming um, studio called That Snow Moon. It's a video game studio. I'm head of people experiences, so that basically means that I'm head of all of talent, talent retention, HR, communications, and people ops in general. I uh, as well have over 20 years of experience so I am kind of old as well <laughs> and I've worked across um, CG animation at DreamWorks for like 13 years I've worked in uh, visual effects uh, video games and um, half of my career I worked in production management the other half has really been around talent acquisition and people ops so I am pumped to be here with you and share my knowledge and hopefully um, you get something out of it. So thanks for having me. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, my name is Dan Leduca. I am an art director at Marvel Games. I've uh, been doing this like everyone else, lots of years. Um, I have a background in environment art and animation, lighting, all that fun stuff. Been around the block for a lot of different companies. Um, really just am excited to kind of talk to everyone here and, um, you know, offer some advice and see where this goes. So thanks for having me as well. Yeah, so a little bit about CG Spectrum for those of you who aren't aware and for those of you who are going to it. Um, so we're a globally uh, top ranked training provider for film and game industry. Uh, the whole point of CG Spectrum that makes it a little bit different is that we're fully remote and we have a learning model that's personalized from with mentors for, from the industry. We've got 170 plus film and game industry mentors and these are people who are actually in the industry right now. So everything that they're talking to you about is usually what, what they're doing that day. Um, we have an 80% job success rate for advanced students. We've got alumni across 90 countries. Um, we have great uh, career development services, a vibrant online community, and we're authorized by Unreal and uh, a lot of the different academic partners. And we're just, it's honestly, it's, it's, it's one of the few schools I've been with that just has a complete, I, I really love the vibe of the school because it does allow for a lot of flexibility in learning and you being remote and choosing how you learn and when you learn during the day. So where we're going to start is uh, this is going to be the part of the webinar. We're just kind of like freestyle it. Um, it is more natural because all of us, we are in the industry, so we're not public speakers. 
Um, so let's start talking about what studios are looking for in new hires and emerging talent. I figured let's kind of start with you, Kelly, because uh, with your talent, with your role of talent people, the, 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 your right now role, uh, what is it again? Current I, role, head of people anyone? experiences. I manage yeah. all talent recruitment. So yeah. So you're, yeah. you're a good person to start off with this question. Yeah, happy to kick it off. Um, I wrote some notes. I kind of like to just write a few kind of keywords that are important to me and then kind of riff. So what I think about um, what we're looking for, what I personally feel that people in general look for, not just myself, are some of the key words um, are passion, drive, initiative, and curiosity. I always say lead with curiosity because, you know, the, this doesn't even start when you're just starting out. This is like, you know, throughout your career, always be curious. Um, we definitely want someone interested in games and ideation and creation. So, you know, for us, we're a game studio. So ideally games, but also like other sort of entertainment, um, CG animation, film is definitely okay as well. Um, and then, um, you know, in terms of like your support, do you want me to just kind of go through all these questions? I'll just cover like these little topics on this slide and then I'll pass it off. Yeah, you you do you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, you know, benefits of working with um, emerging talent definitely is fresh ideas. Loving people that come from new ideas, either from school or just from their own research. It's really lovely to have new ideas and thoughts and um, that come from somebody just starting out. Um, we definitely grow, even like seasoned people grow from new emerging talent. So it's really um, beneficial to a team to have that. And then how our studio supports early career. Um, so we definitely ensure that we have teams established in each department to be able to uh, properly mentor that person in their career development. Um, other than that, we would not hire them just because we want to ensure they're set up for success. We all we also work on we're working on setting up more of a um, systemized kind of buddy system, so you're partnered and mentored with someone. And um, we also like for associates, we ensure that we provide kind of challenging work, so you have. Um, good growth and some some goals that you're able to reach and achieve so that's what do i got you, uh, and uh, and before we uh, head over to like dan and scott um do you actually want to tell us a little bit about the background of that snow moon because i know about it and i'm sure some other people do but like the the reason why i'm asking is because it is a newer studio and it comes yeah. from a lot of top tier talent and the way that you guys are approaching how you actually support early career talent um i think is great yeah, so we're definitely new, less than two years old. Um, we're a narrative-driven, focused game, um, and a, a number of us from different backgrounds kind of joined together to start this company. So I've definitely been there from the very beginning. It was really important for me to be a part of growing the talent, um, growing a culture that is something that we all strive to have wherever we're at. So this was a real opportunity to create a new studio were we able to do that and kind of pull from all of our experiences and really try to realize what we want out of a studio. So um, now we're at about 130 people, I think now. Um, so we're still at the very beginning of development. And, and actually, I personally think out of all the years of experience that I've had, it's been really fulfilling being at a new and developing studio because you're really able to be all hands on deck. You can be a generalist. You're constantly growing and thriving in a space that um, is kind of made for anyone that has drive and passion. So yeah, so that's kind of where we are. You can go and check us out at uh, that's no moon.com. There's my plug. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, what about you, Dan? I mean, those are great points that you brought up, Kelly, by the way, especially with just, I think the one that keeps on hitting me is a drive and passion. Yeah, I mean, kind of stuff that, you know, we look for 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 new talents is what that is. I've, I've always said this is uh, I can always teach people skills. I can't teach people passion. Uh, it's, it's really the one thing. And it, 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 I know that sounds super kind of generic in a way. But if you have a passion and art is for me, art was always my passion and, and animating and all that kind of stuff. So you kind of push kind of push all that art as much as you can. You create these little groups of friends and you just talk art and your whole life is li living and breathing art. Um, that is that passion, that that want, and when it comes to you know being at Marvel, 
you know, we have this passion for the comic books. So we all grew up, you know, reading comic books and, and all that stuff. But that doesn't mean that that's necessarily a must have. What that means is that, you know, what we're looking for is someone who's willing to jump in and read those comics or learn about the, the world of Marvel. Um, but when it comes to that art, like you really have to be able to want that and not just, it's just, it's not just a job. It's, it's, it's kind of a way of life in a lot of way. Um, but yeah. And, and, you know, when you're, when you're talking about like starting early in your career, uh, it's, it's very interesting. And I know this is one of those things where it's, you know, there's always these questions of what do I do? How do I get in? Where do I go? Um, there's a lot of different resources, but you need to be able to just ask those questions. And that's the big thing is asking those questions of like, what do I want to do? Where do I, like, what, why do I want to do this? Is it, is it for money? If it's just for money, then there's other things you can be doing because I can assure you that this is a very, you know, it could be lucrative, but like, it's also about passion and it's about making those video games and, and there's a lot of stuff when it comes to just like having that passion early in your career and asking those questions and reaching out to people and LinkedIn and all those other places that are just like, I don't know, it, it kind of drives you forward. And then, you know, you, you reach out to someone on LinkedIn, and you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe they'll hit me back. And even me, I still do this. I'm like, I wonder if that person will hit me back. And then sometimes they do. And then you're like, wow, they do. And then you start conversations and that's really what it is. It's that, it's that drive to move forward. Um, and that's kind of what you need early in that, in, in your career, at least from my perspective. Yeah. I mean, and I, th those are like, again, I a hundred percent agree with uh, both what you and Kelly said. And then um, just a kind of uh, like a quick follow-up is uh, does Marvel do anything on their end to support your early career talent or like, like what benefits would you think there are in terms of your studio when you are working with emerging talent? So yeah, um, we have we have uh, younger people working with us, and um, we're we're not a you know Marvel Games. We're not a very large game company. We're we're a small game company that we you know we work with extended companies as well. Um, but we do have a we do have younger people working with us, and those younger talent. And it really is about mentoring them and like giving them um, giving them the freedom. Um, my big thing is make mistakes, make them often, and learn from them. Uh, you can't be afraid to screw up, and you know. One of those things is you won't learn if you don't screw up. So screw up often, screw up early, uh, ask questions. Um, we do that a lot. You know, I'll give a big project over to one of, you know, one of my juniors or associates and uh, associate artists. And I'm like, here, run with it. And it's a pretty big thing. And they're like, well, uh, what, what, what if I screw up? I'm like, then you screw up. Then we all screw up together. Then we learn and we make mistakes and then we, we just address it. That's all. It's, it's not life or death here. So yeah. it's, it's really about giving them the confidence to, to make mistakes by trying new things and to expand and grow. That's awesome. Scott, do you have anything you want to chime in on those? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of riff on what you guys were saying. Um, way back in the day, one of the best art directors I ever worked with said something really interesting to me one time about hiring new talent. He said, I hire them for passion and then I teach them the rest. And that, I'm, basically that's, that's what Dan and Kelly were both saying. That, and, and I think it matters. When, when I say passion, that, that in part is um, having uh, an interest in and, and a care for the, the, the work, but it's, I think it's a little bit more than that too. It's, it's, a, it's a desire to do great work. You may not know how to do all the things, but if you have that, that uh, impetus to really lean into it and really put in the hard work to, to get better at what you do, after a while, it starts to show. And that's kind of what he was talking about. Um, when you come in to a job as a, as, a, you know, as a rookie, there's a lot of stuff you don't know how to do, but you can learn that stuff. What, what is difficult to teach is that, um, that drive to really lean into the work and really uh, test yourself. And like Dan says, make mistakes. Um, I, I don't think I've ever been in a situation in all the years I've been in the game biz where somebody who just made a mistake uh, was in any way punished for it. What, what that does is it, it shows that you're taking chances, that you're trying to do better work than you did yesterday. And I think that's really what counts. So yeah, uh, for, for me and for the studios that I've, I've run, what we always looked for is that drive. Uh, and by the way, that doesn't mean being a workaholic. 
it means that you care about the about the result and you care about how your results affect the other people that you work with um as far as benefits of working with emerging talent with actually kelly touched on this in, a, in an interesting way um new people in a team often ask questions that other people have kind of forgotten to ask and that can lead to some really interesting results and sometimes it causes friction because people are like look i just got to get this done stop asking me questions but at the same time sometimes that new thinking sometimes that not knowing what you don't know actually is really beneficial to the team and i've actually seen that in in real time in a team where somebody brand new came in asked a couple of kind of challenging questions and the team had to rethink part of the project and ultimately that was the right thing for the project but you know sometimes when you're when you've been doing it for a long time you kind of get into a groove and you want to do it a certain way and some kid comes along and says well wait what about doing it this way and changes everything so if if you're willing to take the risks associated with that it can benefit the team tremendously but you've got to be you've got to be ready to deal with the fact that sometimes things get messy when somebody wants to change how things are done um as far as you know i'm not running a studio right now what i what i do instead is i i run a, a department at the best school that i've ever worked with but the the support that we offer to students in in our domain has a lot to do with helping people make connections to people like dan or like kelly people who are working in the industry people who are doing the day to day and those those points of contact are immensely valuable to somebody who's trying to get started in the industry at the end of the day most new hires uh for for new talent happen through some kind of personal connection and that's the thing that we really try hard to cultivate uh, inside the school yeah this is uh, all great information um thanks for sharing that stuff um moving forward i think one of the things we want to start talking about too is uh, you, you, all of you brought up the word passion and drive. And I agree with what Scott said, like passion and drive doesn't necessarily mean you're burning yourself out work-wise. I think it's, you know, the difference is like, yeah, I like to cook, but I'm not going to go to culinary school. I'm not going to open up a, like a restaurant. It's something I like to do as opposed to game development and, and, and creative content is something that like I'm driven and passionate to do, which means that I seek out answers on my own. I don't wait for someone to give me answers. I seek out tutorials or like methods of new software or what the industry is doing. So passion is you are passionate about what you're doing. Um, so having said that, I think that's the same thing when we go talk about how to approach the job hunt. Um, you know, um, let's kind of like, Dan, let's start with you on this one. Uh, like for the first one, when we're talking about the job hunt, uh, one of the things that I was kind of like always talking about was reverse engineering. Uh, and we've talked about this a couple of times where we would geek out on me just for context. I've known Dan since college. I've known him for 23 years. Wow. Uh, so we would look at other people's work and we look at studios and figure out, oh, that's where they work from. And we would try to reverse engineer that stuff. Do you want to kind of talk about what we were doing back then or even now? Yeah. I mean, I think this, this is a big thing that a lot of people don't, don't really understand or grasp right off the bat. It's for, for me, and this is kind of when I when I tell younger people or even even people currently in, in like my age, you know, what are you what are you looking to? Where do you want to work? Like, where is that aspirational place that you want to hit to? And then what you do is you go to that, you know, you, you go to that website, you go look at their information, you go look at their their portfolio, their LinkedIn, and, and you, you find out what it is what's about that place that makes you want to work there. Right. And then you start building backwards from there. Right. You go, OK, so I know that, you know, X place does this really, really well. Right. So maybe I should start making my stuff toward that. Now, if you already have a passion toward that place, chances are your portfolio, your style for art is already going to be leaning toward that. Um, it's, it's interesting because I've had people who um, I've been with Disney before as well. Um, so I've had people who apply at Disney and they come to, they show up at Disney and they, their portfolio is all very blood, guts, and gore. And it's all of that. And I'm like, wow, there's some good stuff here, but this isn't really our, you know, what we do. Can you even do what we do? Do you even want to do what we do? Because clearly this is your passion, this blood, guts, and gore. Is it really, it's not the Disney style that we would be looking for for certain things. So it really is about understanding 
what where you want to go and then going backwards from there and not just going throwing like you don't want to just go on LinkedIn and go where where am I or art station go where am I going you know no you want it you want to go you want to like have an aspirational board I keep a folder on my desktop that's like inspirational images um it could be from other artists it could be from companies it could be things that just inspire me and chances are that what inspires me it leans into my style yeah and that's and that's a good point too and that's one of those things which is what I talked about like if you are truly passionate about a particular game, then be truly passionate to Google who made it. Um, Kelly, you worked at Blizzard. When you were at Blizzard, did you ever experience people, because Blizzard's got very specific style to its art. Like, did you ever experience with people submitting stuff and be like, hey, this is amazing, but we are this art style. Have you looked this up before? Yeah, I mean, definitely it's very stylized. So um, you know, it's very niche in, in the way that it's stylized as well sometimes. So, um, they're even more critical, I would say, um, when I worked there in this, and specifically I worked in the cinematics division. And so, um, a lot of times, you know, they would send more like photo reel, or I'd have to provide feedback saying it wasn't a fit. I mean, it's even trickier, I would say, when you, sometimes you don't know what the company is doing. For example, you couldn't look at That's No Moon. We haven't announced a game. We're not going to announce our game anytime soon, but you're like, hmm, their culture, their values, their kind of marketing looks pretty rad. Like, you know, like that, I'm kind of interested in working there. So for example, you could send your art portfolio to me for concept, but you're really not going to know if I want something stylized or grounded in realism. So if you do have the option to apply to a company and you're, you're coming from like an art background and you do have, you know, variation in terms of more realism or, or mere, more stylized work, um, it would be great to provide, you know, multiple types of portfolios and express like what you are really interested in. So I would know, um, but in general, kind of just piggyback, piggybacking, piggybacking on what Dan's saying, it's like kind of know your, know know the company, know who you're applying to. Um, and then, you know, how to approach the job hunt. Um, I'm all about sleuthing because like I'm a headhunter in a sense, like I'm targeting certain people. I like look at everything. I look at like game credits and who's done what, and then I'll go on their art station website. I'll go on LinkedIn. I'll look at like, there's so many different types of titles and job um, jobs out there. So you really kind of have to do the research on what feels most applicable to you and what you, your passion is, you know, but I would also say like, you know, stay focused on truly kind of what interests you in the moment. Um, because that's kind of the jumping off point. You can always change and shift your career later. I did it for myself. I did production management for 10 years. And then I decided, I didn't want to be a producer and I wanted to hire and retain talent. So, but just stay more focused on kind of what you really want to apply for than a bunch of jumbled, unfocused things, because I think it'll be more clear to um, the recruiter or the company when you're applying and they'll know where they want to put you as well. So that's kind of my, it's fine to be a generalist, but in general, I would just say, put your best foot forward instead of sending in a bunch of mediocre work. And I think you'll go, yeah. you'll go a lot further um, with that approach. Yeah, especially if you have like a primary and secondary skill, like if you're a modeler, yeah, maybe your secondary is your texture artist, but even to kind of like, um, I think it all still comes down to the hunt, but also figuring out what you like, because even with That's No Moon, I can go to that, That's No Moon's website. I can look at the people who are working there. I can Google the people in LinkedIn. I can see where right. they were performing. I can be exactly. like, oh, there's a lot of people who work Absolutely. with these studios and they're all have this type of art style and just venture a guess that research. it might be. Research. Research. Exactly. And that, that's, that's, that comes from the drive, not necessarily being knowing everything. It's that you're passionate and driven enough to do that research on your own, which is not like groundbreaking science it's you just hey i'm gonna do that so um and I, and I do believe that one of the things in there is your portfolio is as good as what you know about the industry and, and that's that's a really good point because if i remember uh just to kind of echo back like scott dan and i all worked at midway but there was this point at, at midway when i jumped on to the stranglehold team when we hired yeah. someone we weren't even going to hire anyone just because they found a piece of concept art and did it and their portfolio piece was better than what we were making as a studio. So we're like, yeah, we're going to hire them, obviously. So if the if people always like, what is the bar of quality? 
pop in a game. That's the quality bar you have to hit. Um, Scott, do you want to actually talk about like some of the technical skills for art skills? Because I feel like you guys have been dealing with a lot on yeah. the game inside. It's, it's actually really, really interesting because technical skills are important. And if you don't know how to push the buttons in the right order to make something happen, then it's difficult to actually do the work. But at the same time, technical skills alone, knowing how to use Maya by itself is useless. You have to be able to do something with it. And, and to kind of riff on what Kelly said, I, I think it's more important to do one or two things really well than it is to do 50 things kind of okay. And it really matters. Uh, you know, I've seen portfolios that were just literally all over the place, right? They're just kind of everything they could think of, they kind of threw it in there. And it, it doesn't really tell anybody anything about, about you as a, as a creative or as a, a person who wants to, to do a particular job. You know, if you're, if you're interested in doing modeling, you'd be better off doing a couple of pieces that really well and taking them all the way to something that looks like pro work than doing five half finished projects. And, and it's really easy to do the first 75% of a project. That last 25% is hard work. And that's the thing that a lot of, of uh, people in the industry are looking for. They're looking for that last 25%. Can you do it? Can you actually take it that far? Can you take it all the way to the point that it's credible as pro work? And it's not as if that, that is magic. It's mostly just paying attention and taking the time to do it. So yeah, absolutely. Know your, know your target, know the, the industry, know the corner of the industry you're trying to, to reach into, and then take the time to not only acquire some technical skills, but then learn how to use those skills to accomplish something. Because at the end of the day, what we do is we make stuff. And if you can't get to the point where you can make something credible, then you haven't really done anything at all. All you've done is kind of practice. So take it all the yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, and then that's the other thing, like technical skills, they're just an extension of your art skills. Like that's right. if you- They're just yeah, tools. If you know, yeah, they're just tools. And every single yeah. year, you're gonna have new tools. And then some of the that's tools exactly that are coming right. out might scare you, make you feel like you're not good enough, but you're an artist, trust your art skills and trust your creative problem solving and trust your team and the project and just realize that whatever that tool is, it's meant to help you make the best products in a timely manner to the highest quality. And that's quality. true for everything. It's true for art. It's true for coding. It's true for design. Every discipline basically works the same way, right? There, there are tools that are available to you to, to take it so far, but the rest of it is about you and what you bring to the, to the project. And that's, yeah. what, that's what people are looking for. They're looking for that last bit that takes it all away. Yeah. Um, all right, moving forward, how to succeed. So, I mean, I think we've touched this a lot. What kind of student succeeds and why? Embracing learning flexibility, translating non-industry game to experience and alternative ways to gain industry experience to help land the first job. So one thing across the board that we've all said, what kind of student succeeds? Someone with passion and drive, right? Because of passion and drive, that's gonna be what's motivating you to do the research on what roles are out there, what studios are out there, keeping on top of the actual industry news. But that's going to push you to actually understand this new software and find those things and know the questions to ask, especially if you're at CG Spectrum and we're, we're doing these courses like Scott's courses that they have within the game dev. Um, and then you're meeting with the mentor, the mentor teaching and any type of development, it's a it, you got to meet people halfway. You can't expect someone to give 80 percent. Well, you give 20 percent. Yeah, you guys got to both give the same amount. Um, so when it comes to like and, and like that kind of way to succeed. Um, Kelly, because you've kind of been, you were not in the gaming industry first. So how do you feel like translating your non-industry experience to games? So what made you actually translate from uh, animation and film to games? And how, how did that work out? Yeah, I mean, my career is like, my path is not, it's so random. Like I didn't go to college and I started in the mailroom at DreamWorks when I was 20. Like I'm kind of a street hustler kind of a kid. And I, um, I've i always loved films and I love entertainment. And I was able to get an opportunity to get my foot in the door. And I knew what a privilege that was. And it still is to this day. I am so humbled by my career path. I'm so humbled by the job I get to do and the people I get to work with. And that is never lost on me. So I would... I would say like having that spirit live with you throughout your entire career 
and know kind of what a privilege it is to be in this industry is a beautiful thing. And so I've always wanted to dip my toe in everything. So I was like, okay, I did CG animation for a while. And then um, I was so fascinated by Weta and um, Lord of the Rings and everything. So I was like, I want to go work on visual effects. So then I went to go work on King Kong. And then I did that. And then I, I'm kind of always following like innovation and technology. So I was seeing kind of like games or film is being outsourced and games is was now welcoming like these amazing new graphics and technology. So I decided even though myself, I don't play games, I'm like totally an outlier in all of this. Um, I just appreciate technology and art. And so I decided to leave and um, work in the games industry. Like I never just want to be cushy. I'm always um, leaving kind of when I'm an opportunity where I'm just kind of comfortable. So that way I'm able to kind of challenge myself. And in, in turn, I'm growing and I'm learning and I'm evolving in my career. And so, you know, that's kind of where it's all begun. Like it's just being, once again, I've always been curious. And then I followed that curiosity throughout throughout my career path and the drive and the passion and just the people skills have kept me, you know, in cool positions and, and cool jobs. So again, drive, passion, curiosity. Yeah. So that, it's like, it's, it's the common trend. It's the same, any, yeah. It's the same common thread. Yeah. Um, so alternative ways to gain industry experience to help land your first job. Um, obviously, you know, we've said a lot of things about drive and passion. Um, Dan, do you want to talk about anything that you might think would be like a good way to uh, alternative experience? Because I, I know uh, when we first started off, you were working in like rendering like HVAC systems and stuff like that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I I, I went to school for uh, animation and it was just it was hard at the time um, to get jobs. And I, you know, didn't know what to do. I landed my first job doing like HVAC uh, renderings for schools. Um, exciting as it might sound, uh, there was more out there. Um, you know, it, it really is one of those things where what I ended up doing was, you know, looking toward events as well. Um, and, and I know this is kind of an offshoot, but like, like the C-graphs, the GDCs, all of those things I, I, I went to, you know, I, I visited Rhythm and Hughes back in the day. I went to all these, you know, I hung out with like Pixar at some sort of like staple center like parking lot event at one point in like 2002 but like you do these things right and you're like this is it this it's, it's about networking and meeting people and not being can't use that word but not being mean about things not you know be be a genuinely nice person um about how you go about things don't be a jerk about things um just because like being nice goes a long way um i have you know, I fought this stigmata this my whole career almost. I, I've, I've been told that sometimes you're overly too nice to people or you let people walk. You know what? It's what gets me my jobs because people remember, right? And that's the thing. Um, I'd rather work with someone who's willing to be nice than someone who's like a baller, but just terrible to be around, right? That's what you don't want to be. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the first thing is going to these events, meeting people, just networking and talking and and sharing what you want to do in your experiences and you know every once in a while you you find that nugget where you're like hey do you do this and they're like yes I do it too and then you, you make you make friendships and then your 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 network grows and that's the that's the big thing for getting you your foot in the door is once again it's sometimes about now what you know but who you know as well um and right place at the right time and a whole hell of a lot of luck luck is a big factor in timing so there's, there's just a lot of different things that, that go with this in terms of landing your first job and just alternative experiences in general. Yeah, and I think in general too, on top of passion and drive, it's just understanding that whatever industry you go into, whether it's animation, visual effects, or games, all of them are in studios, which have teams, which have budgets, which have deadlines and time. So if you're someone who's trying to build your portfolio or go to school part-time, but you're working at, let's just say like a coffee shop and you're like working with customers, I think of that as a, an option, like that's an opportunity to practice your communication skills and like showing up on to work on time and understanding your tasks. Those things may seem redundant and like they don't matter, but when you go into an actual job, you're going to be like, oh my God, all these people skills, all these times dealing with like weird, like interpersonal employee fights, like that always comes to light because in the end of the day, we are just a bunch of creatives working on something we're all passionate about, given a small like 
timeline sometimes. So there's going to be stressors, but you are only as good as the like your passion drive will get you a lot of uh, will get you very far. But it's your way that you communicate with your team and with yourself um, what you can and can't do, what obstacles we have, what's needed. That's going to be helped. So think about that when you are doing your other jobs. Um, as maybe sometimes like you might when you're starting off with LinkedIn, you might want to put some of this stuff like, hey, I worked at so-and-so, um, but it's not necessarily needed once you get your first jobs. Like once you get your first jobs, you can go ahead and remove the other ones because we're like, hey, we we're, we get it. You, you're working in an industry now. So we, we're assuming that you know how to talk to people and work within a team. Um, so uh, another thing, um, and we'll, we'll just touch on this really quick before I move forward, uh, Scott, where it says embracing learning and staying flexible. What are your thoughts on that in terms of succeeding in this industry, especially with all the technology that changes and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, look, it, we're in a business where the where the, the target's constantly moving. You know, the technology is constantly evolving. Um, you know, to compare it to, say, the film business, and this is kind of a loose comparison, but, you know, you could shoot a film with a piece of technology from 100 years ago and get a pretty interesting result. You can't do that with a game. Uh, the, the platform for delivering games is changing every moment of every day. And, you know, now we've got consoles that last maybe 10 years, but they still they still move pretty quickly, and so you're you're constantly in the position of having to kind of evolve your thinking about about what you do. Um, I think I think embracing learning goes beyond that, though. I, I, I'm I'll I'll speak to my own career path. I started out as an art and theater major, who discovered computers, and ended up becoming a programmer because I realized that computers were one of the most amazing things I'd ever found for making art. And that led me to a time many years down the road when I knew somebody who had become a tester at a game company who called me up one day and said, hey, do you think you'd be interested in working on porting a game to, from the Amiga to the PC? And I said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So my first gig was actually a freelance gig for, I don't know, four months. You know, this is a long time ago, so games were a lot smaller than they are now. And that led to an opportunity to become a coder in, in the game biz. And being willing to take on things I didn't know how to do, but I was pretty sure I could figure out, is what led me down that path. And I think that's true, whether it's coding or it's 3D modeling or it's writing, all those things involve adaptation. Uh, and you can learn how to do things in one corner of the world that may not be directly applicable to what you might do in games or film or something like that, but you'll find there's a lot of overlap. Um, and even, even people who are uh, highly regarded professionals uh, find themselves having to, to learn uh, new things. I actually hired uh, the guy who wrote three of the Brosnan era uh, Bond movies uh, to write a, uh, a script for a Bond game when I was ele at Electronic Arts. And about two weeks into the job, he called me up and said, oh my God, I had no idea what I was getting myself into because he'd never written for a game before. And you know, typically a guy in his position has to bang out about 88 pages and pencils down, I'm done. He was 200 pages in and hadn't even gotten close to being finished because games are a different creature from films. And so there was a whole bunch of stuff he didn't know he didn't know until he got in there and started working on it. And that was a huge learning experience for him. Ultimately, it turned out to be a great gig and he had a great time and it, it worked out really well. But that happens all the time in what we do. You're constantly learning and constantly discovering things you didn't know you didn't know. But that's part of why it's interesting. Yeah, that's why I have to stay flexible. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, so let's move forward. Um, networking. Um, I know, Dan, you kind of touched on this when you're talking about going to GDC um, and SIGGRAPH and whatnot. Uh, just networking online and in person, what questions ask recruiters and whatnot. So uh, I have some thoughts on this, but uh, I'll let you all kind of start on this. Um, uh, let's just say, who wants to start? Kelly, 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 how do you make a good impression? What makes you Get a good compression. You know what? It's so hard because it's like, especially like recruiters are always like, oh, I'm getting hit up left and right. And 
I care so much about like when people reach out to me because I always put myself in other people's shoes and like remember what it's like when applying and starting out and trying to just get some attention from someone for answers or a foot in the door. And in that way, I really try to uh, give back, you know, sometimes stuff falls through the crack and I'm not able to respond to every, everybody. So I, I'm, when I think of someone kind of reaching out to a recruiter, I'll give you that example. I feel like just to really stay focused on exactly what you're looking for, um, not just like, hey, I need a job. I want to get into a game studio. If you can just kind of be kind of blunt and to the point in terms of and very focused in terms of what your goals are from reaching out to that person, it it feels a lot easier to respond to someone that you don't know or don't have a relationship to. Um, also, what's kind of silly, what people have done with me is like, hey, I see that you worked in animation for 13 years. I'm so interested in getting into this. Like it really shows that you're really paying attention um, to that person's experience and really wanting to garner that kind of specific experience from that person you're reaching out to. That kind of means a lot to me. Just like when I'm recruiting, I try not to be a generalist when I'm reaching out to people and not make them feel special or as individuals. So when you're reaching out to people, think of it the same way. Um, we're all so busy um, with our day jobs, right? But like on top of that, I definitely want to help. So just think of ways where someone will be able to be able to respond to you faster if you ask more like clear and pointed and direct questions. Yeah, very good. I mean, that that's a really good point. Like, and something else that you brought up is that, you know, you have full plates. Uh, and that's the one thing to realize is that Anyone you're reaching out to networking wise, whether it's someone who's a recruiter or someone who actually works at the studio, um, I need to be clear. They're, they owe you nothing. So don't approach them in a way where like you assume that they owe you something. Like I went to school so I'll, or I reached out, so I deserve this. Um, no, uh, and even on top of that, like to, to, to make a good impression online or even in person, uh, it, the ways to just demonstrate the things we're talking about, and, and I'll, I'll toss this back to Dan and Scott, um, where it's, it's demonstrating that passion and drive is if you are asking questions to them, make sure they're questions that they can't easily Google and find the answer to. So if you're answering someone, and quite, like if you reach out to Dan, you're like, well, so what is Marble Games? It's like, well, you didn't like, look it up. Like, you know, like, like don't put the effort to get you a job on their plate. It should be very, very specific. If you are reaching out to them, you can be like what Kelly said, or is very specific. Like, I want to be an environment artist of Marvel games. I have like been working on my portfolio for X amount of years. I'm a big fan of these two projects. I think and highlight someone inside the the, the studio, especially Dan, since you said that studio is small. I feel like I'm a big fan of Dan Leduca's art. I saw his portfolio. I think it's great. Do you mind taking a look at my pieces and let me know if it has the quality that you get? Something so specific that it's so easy for you to answer you know yeah, what it's I mean? that personalization it's, it's personalizing yeah. it and not not you're not doing a, like a robocall right you're, you're 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 aiming it towards something um not being afraid to put yourself out there is a big thing like people people have this tendency to like especially newer people in the industry they have a tendency to kind of go inward and yeah, yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of uh you know, people who aren't external. There are a lot of inward people. I mean, that's artists in general, right? And so like a lot of these people are afraid to put themselves out there. But I've always, whenever I taught uh, students, I always tell them, you know, there's always someone better than you. And there's always someone worse than you. And there's always someone looking at you. And that's the thing. There's always someone looking up at your work. As long as you're doing the work, there's someone looking at it. It's going, like, how do we be like that? And now you may not think that because you're looking at that next person above you. And it's this ladder, right? And you got to remind yourself, you know, take your step, take a step back and go, okay, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm young, I am new. And I, and I want to, you know, not, not to come off like I'm ignorant or something like that, but I want to ask questions and honestly ask these questions, but don't just make generic calls, you know, make sure, like Justin said, you tailor them toward, toward what you're looking for. Because if they're so, if they're so general, I would look at the email or that text or the LinkedIn or whatever it is and be like, this person really doesn't know what they want. Now I've had, 
I've had parents email me. I get, I get tons of parents emailing me going, Hey, my kid is wants to do this or wants to do that. They're in high school. They want to do this. And I'm like, you know what? Let's talk. And I will go out of my way and I'll make sure they talk to them because back in the day we didn't have, there wasn't a lot of that. So like, and when I mean back in the day, I mean, when I was, in, you know, in the early, early 2000s or late nineties, old times, the late 1900s, uh, so AOL. Yeah, it was just different. Yeah, exactly. So now, you know, just, just, you know, be patient, be, be passionate and be yourself when you're asking things and, and don't be embarrassed to ask questions that you may not know the answer to. Yeah. I think there's something else that you said in there too about personalized because I've, I've known students in the past that will literally apply to 40 plus studios and be like, no, 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 go back to me. I'm like, well, what did you just do a generic application and just kind of go to the rooftop and throw your resume out like in a show? Uh, you, you need to, it, it's a risk, I get it, to, to tailor something to one studio, but you really owe it to yourself to put your best foot forward to work at that dream studio. And I really do feel like, you know, uh, a lot of people like a, a person who's young was like, hey, I want to like be in the Olympics one day and I want to like, be like the number one sprinter. Like you have someone you can look up to, like you should have that kind of same thing when you're in this industry. Like I want to work at you know, this studio, I'm working at Naughty Dog one day and I want to be like that artist. It's like, cool, research them, get to know them, find out where they work from. And then when you reach out to them, have your questions like Kelly was saying about having be like, oh, like I saw that you worked at this place before. Cool, you're taking an active interest. It doesn't mean that it's like to fluff an ego, but it's like showing that you are not generically applying to 90 places and Kelly is just one of 30 people you just reach out to. What do you think about that stuff, Scott? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, I guess I would put it in basically three words. Um, be prepared, uh, be humble, and don't ask about money. That's my advice. And I, and I don't mean that you should not consider compensation as part of the equation. Of course you should, right? I mean, you need to get paid to be able to do what you do. But the fact of the matter is that if you lead with that, then the focus is on the wrong thing. The people you're talking to care about what they do, and they probably care pretty deeply about it, and they want to know that you do too. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, don't don't talk about that stuff early on. Talk about what you've learned about what they do, what you've learned about the studio. Um, have an opinion, but uh, make sure you've done your homework. Make sure you're prepared. Yeah, and I think something else too. It's like um, you said something that like they care about what they do, like. If I'm if I am choosing between multiple applicants and there's one person who is like consistently applied and each time is like the work gets a little better, looks like a little better, but like yeah. truly wants to work with me or work with the studio, I will go on my way to work with that person because I see them as someone who's not going to take the job and then jump to another studio. And I'm like, all right, cool, yeah. you want to be here. Um, but yeah, uh, moving forward. All right, so once you land the job, uh, making the most of your first 30 days, how to speak to a manager, communicate with associates, learning the pipeline at studios, big studios versus small studios. All right, so first 30 days, uh, uh, lightning round. Kelly, what's your first 30 days like at your studio when you hire someone? Yeah, just coming in, um, really familiarizing yourself with the studio, with the players, um, with the pipeline, and just use that. And we do this too when with our training. Um, we're just telling people to really just hunker down. Don't worry about showing off your worker yet. Just actually educate yourself on the systems, the players, and everything within the studio. So you really have that good core baseline. Um, to execute and succeed at the company. Very good. Dan, what, do, what about you? What's the first 30 days when they're working at Marvel? Uh, integration. And, and when I mean by integration, I mean integrate into the team, making sure that you feel like you're you're with the team. I'm, I'm remote, so that it's, it adds another challenge. We're all remote in, at Marvel, so it adds another challenge. Um, it's how do, you, how do you make sure everyone's on the same page and talk and keep it open and making sure that everyone is aware of what is expected so people know this is what's happening. You're not gonna win awards that first 30 days, but you're gonna learn. It's all about that learning process. Yes, yes. And then Scott, when you're learning the pipeline at these studios, like what do you recommend the, the best way is to like kind of wrap your head about if you're a new hire and someone says, hey, you need to learn the pipeline this first 30 days. 
Yeah, I mean, half the time people don't even know what you mean when you say learn the pipeline, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you know, so what, what does pipeline? that really mean? It's what that really means is how do we do stuff, right? And there, there, there are processes, there are ways of doing things in every studio. They're always a little different. Yeah, they might use Maya, they might use uh, Visual Studio, they might use the same tool as some other studio, but they'll do it a little differently. And what's really important is to get your head around how those things work so that you know if I do X and I hand it off to this guy, I need to hand it off in this way. Or I need to ask this question before I do the work. There's, those are the things that, that you, you need to learn quickly so that you're not tripping people up. And, um, and I think that kind of ties in also to the difference between big studios and small studios. Um, big studios in general tend to have jobs that are more specialized because they can afford to, right? We can, you can have somebody who does nothing but hard surface modeling for props in level, uh, level building. Um, but in a small studio, they might be doing character modeling, they might be doing hard surface stuff, they might be doing all kinds of things. They may actually be doing build management. I mean, there's no telling because in a small studio, you have to wear a lot of hats just to be able to stay alive. So the, the, the principle of learning the pipeline, of learning how things get done applies in both cases. But I think in small studios, in some respects, it's actually more demanding because you may have to do a lot of different things in order to, to be successful. Now that's the downside. The, the upside is that you get to learn a lot of things. And when I was running my own studio, I had, I had a junior artist who came in who actually did end up helping with build management. That's how crazy it can get. And in fact, at, at CG Spectrum, for quite some time, our head of the real-time department, who was a technical animator by, by training, actually was developing our back end for the school. That stuff happens all the time in small, small organizations, and, and it's both opportunity and challenge. But at the end of the day, it comes down to paying attention and asking questions. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing. When you, your first 30 days, I think it is a lot about understanding who you're working with, managing personalities, understanding the project, getting wrapped up on the pipeline, uh, and just asking questions. Never stop asking questions, because um, and then even when you're talking about how to communicate with your manager, um, if it's issues that is associate, just uh, the way you communicate just openly and honestly and calmly and like dan said before you make lots of mistakes we're going to make many mistakes if you're not making mistakes that means you're not trying and if someone walks into a studio thinking they know everything then they're they're lying to themselves and to you because understanding maya for example in unreal outside of a studio it doesn't matter what studio you go to they're all going to have their own way of doing things that's the pipeline scott was talking about so and their project is going to be different and the way that they communicate is going to be different so a lot of times the first 30 days is not only learning the pipeline or the project, it's learning the personalities. Um, cool. Can Let's I say move. one more thing about communication yeah, yeah. that I think is important is that, um, you know, I think when you're new and you're learning, you know, it's okay to be authentic and be yourself and be vulnerable. So I think you can share that and be authentically who you are, but also like if you're complaining or if you have problems, it's nice if you come with some sort of solution. Um, you know, as a young person growing up, my mom's like, don't complain unless you're coming here with, a, you know, at least pitching me a solution. So it's like when you're thinking about something, saying I'm having this issue, this is what I'm thinking would be a good way to do that. It really shows initiative and drive. And once again, curiosity, I think it's a great way to uh, approach a manager or communicate about what you're having as like an entry level um, employee. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. That, no, that's a great part because it's like showing that you're being a creative problem solver. You're not just bringing your maybe what you're bringing up is a legitimate point, but you're offering a possible solution. All right, moving forward. So, um, well, we're gonna kind of blaze to this one, and then I'm gonna have Scott take over. Um, so we're going to be sending a follow up PDF that's gonna have some resources that you can kind of look over. Big things we're just kind of sharing is just uh, websites you can kind of go to. We've talked about a couple, LinkedIn, um, ArtStation, um, like the rookies and whatnot. But a big resource that you have is yourself. Um, again, like we mentioned before, that passion and drive. You're the one that knows what you want, what you like aesthetically, what you're driven to, um, game-wise, what you're kind of like wanting to do. So only you can really help yourself the most. So use yourself as that resource. And then, like Kelly said, if you had a problem, if you're trying to ask someone a question, possibly have a solution on there to show that you have exhausted possible um, ways to find your own solution to it. Um, but we will be sharing a follow-up PDF with those resources as well. Um, moving forward, 
So Scott, uh, why don't you take some time to kind of like tell us about the actual game development system within CG Spectrum? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I want to start by pointing out that that the way CG Spectrum teaches is, uh, at least in my experience, a little different from from the usual uh, usual school. And what I mean by that is, we we don't use our mentors as instructors. We don't have a mentor sit there and go blah, 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 and tell you stuff. What we do instead is we have mentors focus on helping students understand what they're doing, understand how to do it, understand why they're doing it, understand the, uh, the nuances in, in whatever work they're, they're doing. Um, the instruction is, is largely delivered through, uh, through self-paced work. That the students do and and what we find is that that's a really effective combination and there are a couple of reasons for it um the if you if you're smart and you're dedicated and you're interested in the subject you won't have a problem picking up the essentials of how to do the thing and whether that's 3d modeling or, or writing code in c plus plus you can learn how the mechanics of doing that thing very quickly but what's really tough to learn is the stuff that a, an experienced industry veteran can bring to the equation. They can teach you about how to talk to people about the, the work you do, how to uh, successfully integrate the work you do with the work that somebody else is doing. They can give you an understanding of how uh, processes work in a particular studio. They can help you understand what people are, are most uh, paying most attention to. In the kind of work that they're doing. And so the result is that we kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, because as a student, you're you're learning how to do it, but you're also learning how to be in that job from somebody who's doing that job. And there was one of the reasons I got excited about working with CG Spectrum, because I, I saw how that worked and I was astonished at how effective it is. So having said that, game development, game design, uh, we we break we break the curriculum into two big chunks. The first chunk is an introduction, it's three months long. And it's the purpose of that introduction is to kind of steep you in what it means to be a game designer. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's not just about technique. Yes, there, there is a lot of discussion of technique, but it's also about understanding the theory behind that technique. Why do you do the things you do in game design? Why are games designed the way they are? You know, one of the things that, that we, we find that a lot of people have to do when they're getting involved in game design is kind of change the way they think. You know, most of the, of the students that, that we take into the program uh, are players of, the, of games, right? They're consumers of the product. Um, so they have some intuitive understanding of what games are, but they've never really taken a step back and asked themselves, well, why does a game work that way? And that's what we try to teach people in that introduction. In the nine month curriculum, uh, what we're focused on is building skills. And so we take that theory that you've learned in the, in the introductory uh, program and you start applying it. And we apply it in a lot of different ways it, and ranging from things like designing mechanics for a particular kind of gameplay to designing levels to exercise those mechanics. Um, we, we focus in a couple of general areas mostly in 3D action, uh, not because other categories aren't interesting, but because in the industry overall, the demand is really high for people who understand how to do those things. And uh, the skills that you learn in game design in the domain of 3D action can map into a lot of other kinds of, of categories as well. So from a standpoint of, of teaching people how to do the thing, uh, we find that that's a really effective way to get people started. So programming. Kind of the same pattern, right? We have an introductory program that's three months long. What we teach you in that program is uh, how to code in C++ and it's from a cold start. So you come into the program, you don't even have to know how to spell C++. We will teach you how to, how to code. We'll teach you some of the basic principles of, of software development. Uh, we don't go deep into uh, extensive study of software engineering as a as a broad discipline we focus mostly on the practical aspects of how to how to create good solid code in c plus uh, plus 
Um, but that's, that's on purpose because what we're trying to do is give you the basic tools so that when you get into the game programming curriculum, the long course, uh, you have the ability to, to actually do the work. Uh, so we're, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the theory of software engineering. But what we will do is spend a lot of time on making sure that you understand how to put the pieces together in order to get the work done. If you come into it with experience in another language, that makes it easier. Uh, but it's we teach you all the things you need to know. And then in the game programming course, we focus in, uh, in Unreal. Uh, so we take you with your new C++ knowledge and we teach you how to use that, the, those basic skills in the context of Unreal Engine, uh, actually Unreal Engine 5.1 now, which is a, as I'm sure you guys know, a very powerful platform that's used to make AAA product all over the world. Uh, and we teach you how to do it. And we take you from, again, a cold start, this is the Unreal Editor, to a finished game. And we also actually work with you on portfolio pieces so that you can demonstrate more sophisticated expressions of uh, of your programming skills in Unreal. And then real time, I actually love this one. So there's this little secret in the game biz and, and Dan and, and Kelly, you may be able to corroborate this. Um, there are people in the, uh, in the game industry that sort of loosely are called technical artists. And they know a lot of things about how visuals get into a game. And that may be animation pipelines, that might be rendering systems, that might be uh, rigging or modeling. There are, there are a whole host of, of technical things that have to happen the right way in order for a game to get made and to perform well. And it turns out that those skills are fairly demanding from a standpoint of your technical ability. They're also in very high demand. And if you look around the industry, when somebody in the studio says, I need a technical artist, and Kelly, you may, you may have experienced this, uh, they're, at, they're asking for somebody who's kind of a rare beast. There aren't that many tech artists in the industry, and yet they're needed by every studio uh, around the world. And so the, the real-time 3D and virtual production program is built to help people become technical artists. And it's, it's kind of a generalist uh, curriculum. So we, we, teach, uh, we teach you about materials in Unreal. We teach you about animation systems. We teach you about rigging. We teach you about lighting. We teach you all of the things that a technical artist needs to know in order to, to be able to be a, a contributor to a, to a team. And then in the, in the nine month program, we take those and get into more practical expressions. And we take you into virtual production, which can include both uh, real time and non real time uh, applications. So it's a very broad program. It touches a lot of very technical stuff, but for people who have a head for it and people who, who find uh, that kind of work interesting, it's, it's an immensely rewarding career. And, and I have to tell you that the, the tech artists I know uh, are, are all kind of inveterate problem solvers. They love just making stuff work. And uh, if, if you have a, have a, a kind of a, a, a slant in that direction, you might want to consider the, the real-time program. It's demanding, but boy, it's cool because you get to touch all the cool stuff. And then testing. So there's a, there's a thing about, about QA that I think surprises a lot of people who haven't worked in the industry. Um, my experience has been that some of the best designers and best uh, producers in games came out of QA. Well, why would that be? Well, there's a really simple reason. If you're in QA, you know all the things about what not to do because you've seen them all. And that actually turns out to be a really valuable thing when you're, when you're designing a game, knowing how not to design a game or knowing what doesn't work uh, or knowing how things can go sideways can be immensely valuable for designers. And that's also true for producers. So we offer a, uh, a software testing curriculum for kind of two reasons. First, there is, there's some demand for it. I mean, people, there are people who want to learn how to, how to get into QA because they're, they're interested in, in how software QA 
intersects with games. But there also there's also an opportunity for people who have learned how to how to operate in in software QA to get into games through that door. And as we, you guys have probably uh, uh, realized from what you've been hearing today, getting in the door is really the most important step. Once you're inside the industry, it's a lot easier to change jobs than it is to actually get into the industry at all. And so if you go in by, by way of QA, uh, it's, it's actually a great opportunity for, for a lot of people to find their way into, into games simply by, by way of being a tester. I actually, um, I don't know if, if you guys know uh, who Kenji Inafune is. He was the, uh, the head of, of creative at Capcom for many, many years. Um, his, his number one producer actually came out of QA and then went into localization and then went into production. And that's not an unusual thing at all. So uh, we think this is a great opportunity for people who are trying to get a, get a foothold in the industry. And it also teaches you a lot of things that are really valuable about what goes into a game and how a game actually works. So we have three, three courses, they're all very short. Um, so all of these courses end in a certification. Uh, so when you complete the course, you actually take a test uh, with the, an organization called the ISTQB, which is an international organization for certifying software testers. And when you're done with all three of these blocks, you have three certifications, one as a foundation level tester, one as an advanced software tester, and one as a game, uh, game tester. And those have value in and of themselves beyond the, 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 uh, the insight it get, they give you into, into games. They also actually carry some weight with, with outfits that are testing in the game biz. Cool. Uh, thank you for all that, Scott. That, that's uh, mm -hmm. a lot of information. And for everyone that has <laughs> more questions, uh, this is how you're going to be able to find more answers. So keeping in touch. Um, it's just the various places you can find us online. Our website, I would say, is the best bet, just ctspectrum.com, because it does. it's like our landing page for all of our content. We do have many webinars. We do have well, lots of different events that we do. And um, there is more information going over all the stuff that Scott just covered as well. Um, moving forward from that, Let's start going with Q and A. Um, I've been we've been going through some of it right now. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, you know, one of them is I'm seeing a lot of the same kind of questions more or less. Uh, someone who isn't from the game industry but looking to get in there, but is from the tech industry, almost borders in software engineering. How can I use non not my non game related uh, skills and experience I've gained and develop my benefit in getting into industry? Um, Problem solving, uh, it's, it's gonna be a huge one. So if you're from uh, software engineering, that skill translates very, very, like I would say uh, better than not having it. Scott can probably speak more to it because as I am not a programmer, um, but just in general, um, one of the things that you're gonna have from working in a tech industry, I would imagine is not only be the communication and, and like being able to work with a team, but problem solving, but specifically mm -hmm. for years of software engineering, how easy does that translate over Scott? Is it just you know, understanding it, a different it, programming language? It's really interesting to me. Most of the people I know who are coders in the game biz started out coders someplace else. It happens all the time. Um, sometimes it's hard to get over the, the transom. It's hard to kind of get a foothold in the industry. But once you make it across, you'll find that those skills translate really well. Uh, the reason there is some, some friction in trying to get into the industry is that quite often when a team is trying to hire a programmer, they're trying to hire for a specific set of, of skills and experience that, that you may not have been able to get outside the industry. So they tend to prioritize people who have worked in the industry already, but it's not unusual at all to have people come from other industries. Um, I, I actually worked as a, as a coder in, uh, in the defense business before I, I went into games and that's a that's a common path but i actually hired a guy when i was at sega who had been a coder for safeway so it's not an unusual transition at all yeah very cool uh haley was asking and this might be a good question for you kelly uh it's it's more geared towards saying i program experience with c plus plus but the a general question is, are companies willing to teach applicants if they have good groundwork but are missing certain skills? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I think um, it really depends on the company. And 
It also really depends on like where they're at in the game pipeline. Are they early development? Do they have a good lead up time to, um, there's so many analytical things you think about when it comes to the business. It's not just a general like cast a wide net across companies. It's really dependent on where the company is in the game development pipeline. You know, I would say um, for us, like it really depends. Like, do we have a balanced team where we can set them up with a mentor where we could really take the time to have them hone their skills for that, you know, specific uh, discipline? It just, you're never going to really truly know. But a lot of times they do, I would say for the most part, like if you have a good kind of baseline or just like, say you're really strong with Python and you kind of just started dabbling in C++, I think it's nice to at least kind of take the time to learn on your own because the more you know, <laughs> the better it is just in general. So if you're seeing a lot of like need for C++, which there really kind of is, especially with my experience um, and the type of games and recruitment I'm doing, then I would just go out there and do it on your own and get as much experience as you can and have at least that base. Very cool. Thank you. Um... Dan, I'm going to put this one towards you because you know how to do 2D. Uh, Christina is asking, how can 2D animators get into the gaming industry? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I think there's a few things you got to ask yourself is, what are you looking to do? Do you want to be a character animator? Are you looking for user interface, UI stuff? Are you looking for VFX? There's so much going on in video games that you can really hone your skills toward one certain area. And that's the thing, like, I, I think Kelly, I, I, everyone, everyone has said it here before, but like, it's really focusing your talent towards something, especially when you're, you know, applying for something or looking for something, but you have to ask yourself, what is that you're looking to do? Um, is there a specific game company that you're looking toward that you, you're like, oh, they do something really cool. I wanna do that with that. You know, that these are the things you gotta ask yourself before you just, you know, throw out the general 2D animation because that's so broad. That could be anything from from just UI graphics to, you know, marketing to anything because that's all part of it, right? So really try to figure out what it is that really excites you and what you want to hone in on and then aim toward that. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so Hanny has a really hard question. Uh, currently, I'm working at a smaller game studio for a journalist. Uh, I'm going to skim over it. I feel a desire of changing work pace. I think a journalist hasn't pushed me to the role that I want to be anymore. Um, I do enjoy cinematic visuals, such as Unreal Connectors course with CGA Sweetly, creating a story mood and selling projects. I would like to hear your advice on preparing for a more challenging job in studios who are chasing higher visual production standards. I am not as young as the graduates, but I fear the longer I stay where I am, the less I will grow. Um, I feel you, Annie, I've been there. Um, I've, I think we've all probably been there at a certain studio where you're working at studio and it serves its purpose for what it is. And then eventually you start to feel like you're losing your drive. People aren't pushing each other. Um, who wants to tackle this one? Can I just say something about just even the thought process of that? You're already winning as a human because you're already have, you know, you're already thinking about yourself and your drive, it's, it, I can relate to it so much because like, even though I had a lot of job satisfaction of where I was, I was looking to grow and I didn't want to like sleep on mom's couch anymore, so to speak. So it's like the fact that you're already curious and thinking about yourself to kind of step outside of the box and like really push yourself you're already, you're already head of the game. You're going to get there. Like, you know, start applying and start looking for those roles that are going to satisfy your hunger. Um, while you had your job, like do your job and do it well, while you're there at that employer, continue to do that. Definitely don't drop the ball because you're, you're losing that drive. But in the meantime, do your side hustle of looking for that next gig. Yeah, yeah Kelly's right. exactly right. I mean, the, the tools that are available now, to, to make stuff that you can show other people are crazy powerful. I mean, think about it. You, you can take Unreal Engine and one person can make the most amazing, beautiful content you've ever seen. It just takes some skill and it takes some time and it takes a lot of effort. So do that, right? Chase the thing that you're interested in, go do it, learn how, and then you can show it to people. Yeah, right? I think... I think that's exactly it. What Scott just said is showing showing your work to other people 
and not just holding on to it and being like, oh, yeah. I don't, it's not ready yet. Show people and, and they'll be like, oh, this isn't feeling it. And then don't, don't get upset by that because there, maybe there is something you're, you're missing. And then you go, okay, how do I get to that next step? You know, and then just keep learning. And, and really, especially when it comes to like a 3D portfolio, you know, it's not about the quantity of stuff you have jammed into that portfolio. It's about that quality of that one or two pieces that tell a solid story. Even a, a simple prop tells a story, right? You want to be able to show it. Someone goes, oh, I know exactly what this is. And, you know, chances are if you're at a company, let's say you're at Studio A, we'll call it, and they're not giving you what you need in terms of like fulfillment, you know, you're going to have to spend those the, your extra time working on your own stuff and that's what that's but that's that's part of being an artist you know you want to do that like I don't know how many Friday nights I'm like well I'm not going out I'm gonna just hang out and put on a put on like you know murder she wrote and just watch you know watch yeah. something you know and work on something it's what you do right and then you just get better and you keep doing that I use Spotify but yes you're right <laughs> yeah Here, here's one um uh, again maybe Dan, you can uh, handle this with uh, being an art director at Marvel. Um, when someone is at a studio, how are assignments uh, and projects uh, distributed and assigned? And do you pick it or do the employees have downtime between projects? Um, so, you know, we're, we at Marvel, uh, we're a very unique uh, setup. Um, we have a lot of games happening at one time. We have a lot of games on our plate in general. Um, and that's great. Uh, and the way it works is like, you know, I'm in a certain area of Marvel that uh, focuses on a certain area of games um, without getting too specific about stuff. Um, but it, it really does. If, you, if you're like, oh, I really want to work on something, at least for us, you know, our team is so small that we just, we're all talking. You know, we, we have talks every day to our, our whole team. And we talk about all our games all the time. Um, and then, you, you know, you show interest in stuff. And you, you know, you see. And also, one thing I've learned is just because you're not on the game doesn't mean you're not going to affect the game. Because at least for us, uh, we still have input on games that we're not directly on. And we're still helping and directing and doing stuff like that as well. So it, it really is, you know, in, in that world of like, is there downtime? There's never, there's never really downtime because you're always doing something. You're always prepping for the next thing or learning or learning for yourself so you can be better for your company. Um, and you're always trying to be the best you can be going forward for the, for the team as a whole. So there is no real downtime between things. And chances are, if, you know, if you're not a wallflower who just comes in and leaves nine to five and not pays attention, uh, if you're involved in things, then you're going to be, you know, pretty in depth to everything and know what's going on, at least from my experience. Amazing. We did it. We got through the webinar and we answered all the Q&A. <laughs> um, I just want to say you to uh, Scott, Dan, and Kelly for helping out with this today. And um, again, uh, make sure to check out cgspectrum.com. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be also sending out a resource packet for you to all have. Um, one more that Joseph is putting between the line. I have dreamed few dream studios I'd like to work with, work as a concept artist, but I'd like to ask whether it's viable for someone just breaking the industry to actually land these positions. I'd be competing with ours. Um, you know what? Shoot for the stars. I think that if you have a dream studio, you should always be aiming your goals towards that dream studio. Because if it's a dream studio, chances are the quality is super high. And I would, like the worst case scenario, you're gonna walk away with a portfolio that you can buy someplace else. But this is also where you researching and understanding what the studio is, checking out people who've worked there. Again, if you go on LinkedIn and maybe someone has worked at that studio and you see like, oh, five people work at the studio, but they worked at this smaller studio beforehand. So maybe your best chance is to work at this studio to get more experience than work with the other studio. So a, a case would be Vans at Marvel. Marvel works with a bunch of studios already through outside sourcing. So what if you work with one of those studios and then before you know it, you find yourself interacting with someone like Dan from Marvel and then you build up a rapport and before you know it, you're at Marvel. Because I could say, pretty flat. Uh, I've known Dan for a long time. And even when he was younger, he said, I want to work at Disney. And he worked at Disney twice. And like, so it's but, but funny, funny that thing, we're, we're, we're cooking that I, I, my parents dropped off a box of papers the other day that was like, from my first grade, because parents are weird like that. They hold on to weird stuff. Uh, and in my first grade, it was like, what do you want to be when you're older? And it was, I want to work for Disney. And it was one of those things where my kids, I have kids, and they're like, 
dad, what did you want to be when you were younger? I'm like, I want to be exactly what I'm doing. It's weird, but like you keep going. Even if you have parents who are like video games aren't a real thing, you know, you still keep going because people are always going to knock you down because you're trying to do something that you think you want to do. Right. And it's just, you got to keep pushing and keep going for stuff. Yeah. All right. We have one more anonymous uh, and then that's all because we got to let these talented folks get back to their day jobs. Um, if you are trying to be a character artist, you graduated, but you don't have a lot of studio experience, how can you get a junior position? Because all you notice is that senior roles are being posted. Uh, honestly, just you have to, especially for a character artist, ooh, you have to have a really good understanding of anatomy, fabric, how things move, adding character like that stuff on top of understanding sculpting and being able to understand uh, topology and creating textures and material. So let's just put that to the side. Um, I would venture that any state you're applying for, if you can show a portfolio that it's on par with the senior artist portfolio, and the only thing that's missing is you don't have maybe like the six years experience you're looking for. Uh, I'm not going to say talk for Kelly, but I would talk to you still because in my mind, if I have a budget and a time frame, and you're younger and I can help train you, you're worth talking to. So don't let the lack of junior roles that are shared on studio websites stop you from showing off your work if you feel that out of all the stuff they're asking for and the quality bar that's out there, you just are like missing that one part that's like, I don't have the experience that they have, but everything else stacks up, reach out. Yeah. And then I would just say like how you guys were saying earlier, it's like share your work with other people that can really provide that feedback to vet that work. So it's not like you're looking at through it from your, like your own lens because a lot of companies do what's called like strategic hiring. And that's mm -hmm. kind of like hiring outside of the budget or maybe they see a rock star and they're like, man, we need to find a way to hire this person. So think about that. A lot of times studios, they do have their positions posted, but if you apply and they really notice like your skill set is like, you know, really high, there sometimes is a way to hire, uh, you know, maybe another person or a strategic hire. Um, great. Well, thank you again. This has been very informational for me. I hope it's been inf informational for our uh, participants. Again, uh, we're going to send you follow-up uh, information and uh, cgspectrum.com. Please check it out if you guys have any other questions. Um, and, you know, our names are right on the wall. So if you want to try finding us on LinkedIn uh, and practice some of the stuff we've been preaching, uh, we can go from there. Um, cool. All right, everyone. Thank you for your time. And uh, that's that's about it. That's all. Thanks, we have everyone. Today. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. See you Appreciate later. Us. Bye. bye.